Hello and welcome to Ashgrove Online. My name's Dave and I'm the senior pastor here at the church. And I'm glad that you've joined with us today. And I want you to know that we're a church that values community, living in authentic relationship with each other. And in this season, it might look a little different, but it's not impossible. It starts right here with you connecting in for church online. So wherever you are in the journey of life, I'm glad that you've joined with us today. And if you'd like to get in touch with me or one of the pastors, please head over to the Contact Us tab at our website, ashgrove.org.au. But for now, stay tuned. Ashgrove Online will start in just a few moments. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning from Egypt where I've been in lockdown like you have in Australia uh, since early in March. It's a pleasure to be able to join you like this this morning where we're can into this wonderful series that's happening on Sunday mornings looking at the great mission of God and how all of us are involved in that. Recently I was asked to read a book about, that's about to be published called Where Is My Sister? I was asked to provide a comment for the back cover. This book's a collection of stories of women who the author shared life with when she and her family lived in the Sindh in Pakistan. What struck me as I read the book was the profound role of hospitality. This isn't a book that's about strategies, it's not a theoretical book on missiology, it doesn't have the seven keys to effective global mission. These are stories, stories that pointed to the heart of mission, that spoke a clear missiology of hospitality, that told of lives changed and transformed, including that of the author through shared hospitality. Now, in the post-COVID-19 world, global mission and the global church are facing questions about what it means to make disciples of the nations. If global mission is about sending people to other places, then we're in trouble. We've got border closures, we've got travel restrictions, there's financial challenges, Rising nationalism, there's distrust, there's fear. These are just some of the issues that challenge this traditional paradigm we have about mission being all about sending. Of course, this morning, we're also remembering the end of Refugee Week. And so I want to focus on a significant theme that I believe scripture has that can radically change our understanding of making disciples of the nations. And it is, of course, what I've already mentioned, that of hospitality. What's the biblical concept of hospitality? And what does it have to do with global mission? We discover both in the Old and New Testament that they deal with it, this theme in a range of different ways, not all of which we're able to explore today. But here's my starting point. Practicing hospitality enables us to see the other so that relationships are established that have profound consequences for how we live together in the world. Generous hospitality plays an integral role in reconciliation and genuine embrace of the other. Hospitality also allows for creating space, space that allows room for both the host and the guest or stranger. Important, I think, for discipleship that's mutual, that happens together. I believe that these things help us to think about mission as more than sending. They help us to think about mission as this radical sharing of life that leads to transformation. With growing numbers of conflicts and increased border barriers in our world, our involvement in global mission in the post-pandemic world, in this world that's overwhelmed by an ongoing refugee crisis, must embrace and welcome the other, 
We must accept the hospitality of the other. We must find and create in that welcome a safe place, a safe space to encounter God. Now, if we go to the scriptures, we're going to do a run through scripture. So you might want to note down some of these scriptures. I'm not looking at any passage in particular, but I want to look at the theme of hospitality throughout scripture. So you might want to note the passages down and be able to read them and spend some time in them yourself later this week. Israel, of course, experienced God as the God of hospitality. Stories of hospitality are foundational to Israel's very existence and identity. They contain themes and tensions which resonate through centuries. Stories of hospitality received and of hospitality abused. We might start with the story of Abraham and Sarah in Genesis chapter 18, where they entertain guests who bring good news that they would have a son. And these guests also bring a warning that God is about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. At the heart of this story is welcoming the stranger. Hospitality was considered an important duty and often we see the hosts becoming the beneficiaries of their guests and strangers. Let's think about Rahab and her family, saved from death because she welcomed Joshua's spies. You can read about that in Joshua chapter 2. We can think of the widow of Zarephath, benefiting from Elijah's visit. And you can read that in 1 Kings 17. So here's what's important. Israel's obligation to care for the stranger is because of her experience as a stranger and an alien. God instructs Israel to care for the alien and stranger because they themselves were aliens in the land of Egypt, is what he says. You can look at Exodus 22, 21, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 34, and Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 19. Jesus goes further. In Luke 14 and Matthew 25, he distinguishes between conventional and Christian hospitality. This is what he says in Luke chapter 14 and verses 12 to 14. When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your kinsmen or rich neighbours, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. This, of course, is a prelude to the parable of the great banquet, this powerful metaphor for the kingdom of God where all are welcomed. When the expected guests turn down the invitation to the banquet, the same group, four groups are to be invited, the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. And then Jesus opens it further and says, and everyone else from the highways and the byways. Now, the theme of banqueting, of course, is full of food and drink, and it's very central into the min in the ministry of Jesus. He was accused, of course, of being a glutton and a drunkard, of eating with sinners. We read about that, for example, in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 19. Jesus was celebrating the kingdom of God come among them, but he did it with all the wrong people. But he also, with his followers, points to the abundance of God, Think of all the stories of food and drink overflowing, of parties enjoyed, of feeding of five thousands. God's household is one of superabundance. It's one of extravagant hospitality, where food and wine are generously shared and the divine welcome is generously offered. Shared meals, therefore, are central to hospitality. And to mission. Because it's in eating together we begin to share stories. We let our guards down and we welcome strangers. But these two things go together. The sharing of food with the sharing of stories. Reverend Rebecca Nyagenya, chaplain at the Uganda Christian University, says that in Uganda, 
Hospitality goes with both elaborate meals and listening to the stranger, to the visitor. For any relationship to be strong, food and intentional listening must be shared. Listening is an important part of honouring the guest in both hospitality and mission. Listening to the other is the beginning of understanding and of entering the other's world. I've been nearly 40 years in mission. Next year, 40 years since I first went overseas. And I'm challenged because what I've recognised is my own arrogance that believed I already knew what to say as I engaged in mission long before I stopped to hear what people were saying. Yes, we want to proclaim Christ, that's true. But we do this as we listen to people and to their needs, their hopes, their dreams. And we hear how God's word speaks forgiveness, wholeness, truth, and transformation into that lived context. Because a powerful expression of hospitality is found in the celebration of communion where this ritualised eating and drinking together reenacts the very crux, the very heart of the gospel. As we remember what it cost Jesus to welcome us into relationship with God, we remember with sorrow the agony and the pain. But at the same time, we celebrate, we rejoice in our reconciliation and this new relationship that's made possible because of Christ's sacrifice and supreme act of hospitality. We rejoice in our new relationship with God made possible through the cross. And we rejoice as we partake of this meal together in community. And of course it points us to the heavenly banquet when we'll eat together with those of every tribe and nation and tongue in the marriage feast of the Lamb. Hospitality goes further, that the crux of it is seeing the other. I wonder what you saw as you watched the video from the UN that we saw, as you listened to, this, to the interview that was done. In Matthew 25, we're confronted with the parable of the sheep and the goats. Some ask Jesus the question, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? You can read it in Matthew 25, 37 to 39. Now we all know what Jesus answered. So hospitality can have this subversive dynamic. When we do as Jesus commended in Matthew 25, visit those in prison, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, entertain the stranger. We're living out a very different set of values and relationships. We're according dignity to the other. We're breaking social boundaries. We're including those who are so often excluded. We're engaging in transformation. This transforming hospitality begins we're seeing the other person with the act of recognition. It requires looking the other in the eye. The establishment of the I-thou relationship is a fundamental act of hospitality because it acknowledges the person's humanity and accords them dignity. It denies their invisibility. Christine Pohl, in her book, Making Room, Recovering Hospitality as a Christian Tradition says this, Hospitality resists boundaries that endanger persons by denying their humanness. It saves others from the invisibility that comes from social abandonment. Sometimes by the very act of welcome, a vision for a whole society is offered, a small evidence that transformed relationships are possible. Think about the Good Samaritan. He refused to pass by or to pretend that he'd not seen the wounded man. His act of hospitality crossed ethnic boundaries. It caused him great personal cost as well as inconvenience. And it saved a life. 
When we see the other person, we see the image of God as well as our common humanity, which establishes a fundamental di dignity, respect, and a common bond. Christian hospitality is the heart of Christian mission, requires that we actually see the guest and the stranger in our worlds. At the end of Refugee Week, do you see refugees in your own community? But also, do you see them across the globe? Just last week, or it may have been the week before, another boat sank off Tunisia. 46 bodies have been recovered and several are still missing. These are people who we need to see in our world. The UN report on refugees that we saw require, reminds us of the consequences of atrocities around our world that call us to fresh practices of hospitality as mission. The compassion that's generated when we see the other as our sister and brother. There are ethnic and cultural barriers to cross, for sure, in order to hear and understand and embrace. We also must cross these in our own history with its pain for our indigenous sisters and brothers. Yes, we must cross in our own nation ethnic and cultural barriers. But I want to suggest that poverty is a pretty good place to start with hospitality. Why? Well, because poverty of heart and mind creates space for the other. Poverty actually makes a very good host. Poverty of mind, heart and even resources where you're not constrained by your own possessions, but you're able to freely give. There's something in this paradoxical power of vulnerability and the importance of compassion. Making ourselves vulnerable reminds us that hospitality and engagement in mission require authentic compassion and genuine love. Somehow these are more freely expressed and experienced from a context of poverty. Poverty that's both within as well as without. Poverty of heart and minds reminds us that we are the needy ones. That our hands were empty before God filled them. That you and I are in need of grace and forgiveness, of healing and newness of life. Genuine hospitality as well as genuine engagement and mission can then begin as we realise our own emptiness, our own need for God. As we experience the divine welcome that's born out of divine compassion, we can share this grace of hospitality with others. But God's so much more than that, isn't it? This idea of hospitality is not just a theme through scripture, but it is in the very nature of our God who creates a space within the Trinity, the triune God that welcomes us. I love Rubelov's icon of the Trinity, which is very much based on the narrative of hospitality. God is a community of three divine persons. God is one. But God is this community, this reality that allows not only for relationship, but also for unity and diversity within the Trinity. This Trinitarian understanding of God means we experience God in relationship with the other within that community of the Trinity. In such an understanding of Trinity, we pick up many themes of hospitality, themes of welcome, of home and of household as a place for hospitality of relationship, of seeing the other. Henry Nowen gives it a practical implication when he says this, hospitality means primarily the creation of a free space where the stranger can enter and become a friend instead of an enemy. Hospitality is not to change people, but to offer them space where change can take place. Now mission, that divine invitation of God to enter into a loving relationship with him is about allowing people the space to come to God in their own way, to become the person God created them to be. Mission's not about invading their space, forcing them to come to Christ in the manner of, say, the conquistadors, vanquishing them in the name of Christ. 
nor is mission the imposing or transplanting of Christianity to make them like us. Mission is an invitation, an invitation which allows space for people to change. Here, however, I want to say that there's a little more to it than just inviting others in and allowing them space. Yes, we do need to invite them in. We need to allow a space for them to come in on their terms. But it's not the end. Because what we're offering is a space where change is possible. We invite people in on their own terms. That's real hospitality. That's the divine invitation. We don't invite people in and say, you can come in if you believe what I believe and behave what, as I do. That would be manipulation, exploitation. But mission's the divine invitation to know Jesus. And this implies change. The hospitality of mission may also mean confrontation. Creating space does not mean there's no room for dialogue or disagreement. Rather, creating space means allowing for a spaciousness in all of our encounters. This is what genuine, humble hospitality can offer. And this is what mission is all about. An encounter with the other in the name of Christ. This metaphor of hospitality as creating space allows for space that is both in the privacy of our own homes and hearts as well as in the public domains as we engage in mission. Mission has at the heart of it creating space. There's a wideness in God's mercy. There's a space for all to come in. In the divine invitation, it's whoever believes may have eternal life. And that returns us, doesn't it, to the theme of the great banquet where all are invited, all may come in, and where ultimately we may be surprised at who is feasting at God's table. If you're wondering about the link between global mission and our theme for today, hospitality, let me try and summarise it like this for us. Global mission is more than sending people to somewhere else at great expense and praying for them. Global mission is for all of us. But global mission is also about seeing the other, the refugee from Syria, from Iran, Iraq, Yemen, and so many other places. The rural communities in Laos and Cambodia, Tajikistan, and seeing their lives struggle to offer their families exactly what you and I want to offer our own. It's about seeing the urban elite in Dubai or Bangkok or Beijing, the urban poor in the slums of Nairobi or Delhi or Cairo, the persecuted minority in Tunisia or Somali or Kurdistan, the church growing under persecution in Algeria, Iran, Turkmenistan, we need to see these people, to see them as people and to open the table of hospitality to them. What do I mean? What I mean is that we need to create safe and inclusive spaces where they can encounter Jesus. This may be through the sending of people to work with them and become part of their communities. It may be through supporting the church that already exists in those spaces so that it may be that safe place of hospitality. It may be through inviting those among us here in Australia who have come from these nations, inviting them into our spaces here so that when they return, they are able to create safe spaces of encounter with Jesus because they've encountered him as they've been with us. The global mission is also about hearing the other at this table of hospitality. I love that image from Uganda of listening being an essential part of good hospitality. We need to hear the stories of the others so we can embrace their story in a way that meets, enables it to meet the great story of Jesus and be transformed in that encounter together. There's so much more that we could say, but let me leave us with a couple of questions. Things I'd encourage you to explore this week as you think through these scriptures. 
Who can you offer hospitality to from the global community in order that you may hear their story and create a space of encounter so that you and they are transformed through encounter with Jesus? And secondly, how can you be part of offering and receiving hospitality that reaches beyond our own national boundaries, that crosses the globe? Let's pray. Father, we acknowledge your goodness, your greatness and your glory. We acknowledge that your story is one of invitation for us to come in to the community of you, God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We acknowledge your invitation for us to feast at your table. And as we think about mission across our globe, starting with our own local community, Father, teach us what it is to embrace the other in acts of hospitality that create spaces where people might encounter Jesus. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.